Good morning. Welcome to Linwood and welcome to the unconditional love of God, whoever you are and wherever you are on your journey of faith. You are welcome here. I feel like we should all just sit on this side and then I would have an easier time actually talking to everybody. We are concluding our worship series on dinner with Jesus this week. And maybe the best question that we can ask ourselves is really simple. Is God still present at our table? Is God a reality that we experience here and now in our everyday lives? Christianity is an incarnational here and now faith. And that means that our earthly lives, our very bodies, are holy and sacred because the maker of heaven and earth is pleased to dwell within them. The ground we walk on is holy, because God walked and ate and slept and worked and died upon it. Do we live with that awareness, or are we waiting to experience God somewhere else in some other way? I love the theologian Frederick Buechner who said, one of the blunders religious people are particularly fond of making is the attempt to be more spiritual than God. (laughs) We don't have to float with the stars in order to find God. We just have to honor what God has made this day and every day. So in that spirit, I invite us to stand for this morning's call to worship. A gift of a new day. Whoops. And that's last week's, and we're going with it. In Christ we are made new and filled with hope. In God we belong to a new community. Discovering Discovering we we are are friends, friends, sisters, and brothers in Christ. In Christ, the old ways have lost their appeal, for we we have have turned turned toward toward a new new light. In God, we receive a new name and a new call. We We are are God's beloved, and we carry carry on the ministry ministry of reconciliation. In Christ, we are a new creation. The The old old is passed away, away, and we live as signs of reconciliation and love. Let's sing together. praise 
Without a doubt we'll know that we have been revived when we shall leave this place. Sweet Spirit of Christ, we invite you to turn and greet your neighbor. Pass peace and love with one another. My way, my truth, my life, such a way as gives us breath, such a truth as ends all strife, such a life as killeth death. My light, my feast, my strength, such a light as shows a feast, such a feast as men's in length, such a strength as makes his guest. Come, my joy, my love, my heart, such a joy as none can move, such a love as none can part, such a heart as joy is in love. Today's scripture is from Luke the tenth chapter. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. These Sundays without the choir, I'm like, what? It's 9.45 and I'm up already? I'm confused. So I saw this cartoon quite a while ago, and it was about a religious pilgrim. He was depicted in kind of a, a stereotypical way, right? Old man, long white hair, long white robe, long flowing robes, and, and he was looking kind of haggard, and he came up to a fork in the road. And to the left, the sign said, the meaning of life. And to the right, the sign said, cheese and crackers. <laughs> what did he do? What should he do? Which way should he go? Well. I think if he was following in the way of Jesus Christ, following in the incarnational presence of God, it would not be a moment's hesitation. He would go straight for the cheese plate where he would find so many other people 
eating and drinking and talking and laughing and sharing in the banquet feast of life. The word became flesh and lived among us. For God so loved the world that he sent his son. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. These are very basic tenets of our Christian faith that we worship a God who has become human, who has walked among us, walked as us, a God who eats and sleeps and laughs and cries and, yes, burps and does all the other disgusting things that we associate with having a body, an incarnational, present God, fully human, fully divine. We say it, but it is pretty hard to really grasp, isn't it? I mean, in a lot of ways, it is much easier to imagine God as some far-off, distant, abstract concept, a divine light, a holy consciousness removed somehow from all of the mundane stuff of everyday life. Because it's hard to imagine God as one of us, and yet it's what we proclaim all the time that in Jesus Christ, the divine and the very, very imminent human have kissed. We are eternally embraced forever. Here's how Bishop Will Willimon put it. He said, sorry if you prefer your God to come at you in an exclusively spiritual, inflated, pale blue and fuzzy vagueness, hermetically sealed from where you actually live, because in Jesus, God gets a body. God gets a body. And as we know from the scriptures, not everyone liked what God did when God had a body. God touched other bodies that people said shouldn't be touched, crossed the boundaries of of ethnicity and nation to reach out to bodies that others said shouldn't be welcomed. If you remember our story from last week, Jesus sat at a table with the religious leaders of his day, and they said, you are a glutton and a drunkard because you're eating too much and you're celebrating with all the wrong bodies, tax collectors and sinners. And yet, That's the God we celebrate, a God who, according to the Gospel of John, very first miracle was to show up at a party, a wedding, and turn water into wine. That's the God we celebrate. And it wasn't two buck chuck. Even the scripture says it was the very best wine served that day. A God who is very much present. Jesus was a wandering rabbi who did his best work at the dinner table, not at the sacrificial altar of the temple. And our our scriptures also tell us that when God restored the life of this one Jesus, he came back eating and drinking and celebrating life with us, a physical resurrection. Now, that's even harder for us to really embrace than the incarnation, isn't it? But think about how radical these claims really are. Our Christian faith tells us that this life, our bodies, this world, matters so much to God that he came and walked among us, and after we killed him, he came back to walk among us. If we question whether this life is being redeemed, all we have to do is look at the incarnation and the resurrection. Matter matters to God. God still has a body. It's us. The Apostle Paul said we are the body of Christ 
And I know that we take that very spiritually and metaphorically. I think this is one of those things we need to take literally to get the full power of it. We are the body of Christ here and now in the world. Christianity practices the spirituality of materiality, meaning that all of life is sacred because God's word created it. God inhabits it. God is pleased to dwell within it. It doesn't mean that the world encapsulates God. God is more than that. But God includes everything we see and all of our stories. Our real lives are precious and included in God's life. It is a a very strange, uncommon spirituality, really. If you peruse the bookshelves at a bookstore, when was the last time we did that? We know where they are, right? We've seen one sometime. Or you search on Amazon for spirituality books. Most of the top 10 aren't going to include much about this actual life. So I did that this past week. Here are a few of the titles. Mind Magic, the Neuroscience of Manifestation. I'm not sure what we can manifest with our magic minds, but something. Becoming Supernatural. And The Journey of Souls, Case Studies of Life Between Lives. I'm still trying to get this life right. I don't know what's going to happen between lives. Now, it is easy, of course, to poke fun at that. I'm not really trying to. Obviously, our thoughts and our minds are really, really important. But it suggests somehow that the life of the mind is separate from the life of the body. And that's not at all our tradition. Not that you'd know it, based on how we practice Christianity much of the time. It seems to me that when we get tired of working for justice, far too frequently we tell people, just accept the unacceptable. We don't know what to do about it. Make peace with what should truly be changed, and just hope that in the afterlife, things will be better. And when real bodies here on earth are more diverse than we're comfortable with, when real lives, when real wants and needs are more diverse than what we're comfortable with, we tell people that their wants and needs and bodies are somehow the enemy of the soul. God made them wrong, and they should deny it. And when you look at the world as it is right now, right? With it, it's literally on fire, and real people are suffering from war and hunger. Even though we don't always know what to do about it, we can't just pray and meditate. Not if we really follow the incarnational God. It's meant to change how we live. Our incarnational faith, this spirituality of materiality, is not materialism. It's not materialism and consumerism. We know a lot about that, right? In fact, it's the opposite of that, right? In our, in our culture, we kind of worship a religion of making matter cheap so we can acquire more of it rather than really recognizing how sacred and precious it truly is, right? We like our conveniences. I absolutely include myself in that. And we like our relatively affordable food, our relatively affordable clothes, relatively affordable products that we purchase all the time, don't we? But the truth is they are more expensive than what we are paying. It's just that other people, other bodies, are paying the price. And usually, those bodies are black or brown, often female, 
living in far away countries where we don't have to see that actual cost of our materialism, right? But it's real. There is a real price to be paid. And I think the only way we somehow move beyond it is this incarnational reality that Jesus came to proclaim, that everything is sacred and that we have to pay attention to that sacredness and live so that everything else can truly live. So this story that we hear today in the Gospel of Luke, it's a classic one. We're all familiar with it. Donna said this morning that she thought she could probably just recite it from memory, right? And it is relatively short. Right? But I think it's a story about Jesus telling us how important it is to pay attention, to pay attention to the people around us, the word made flesh in our very midst, not instead of action, but so that our action is truly merciful and just. So the Gospel of Luke tells us that Jesus is in the home of Mary and Martha, these two sisters. Their brother Lazarus is the one that Jesus very infamously raised from the dead in the Gospel of John. And Jesus was probably in their home frequently because they were good friends of Jesus and they were benefactors of his ministry. They supported him financially. And at least this particular time, Martha and Mary are having a little bit of a sibling dispute because Martha has been very, very busy, right? She's taking care of everything. She's cooking, she's cleaning, she's getting the house prepared for Jesus. And we might say she's doing the kind of tasks of hospitality that we might associate with a traditional female role, right? She's getting things ready for her guest. And Mary, on the other hand, is seemingly doing nothing at all. She's just sitting there listening to Jesus, learning from Jesus. And Martha says, hey, get her busy. Do you want to eat sometime tonight? She needs to help out. And then Jesus says this audacious thing. He says, Mary has done the better part. Now, Show of hands, honestly, how many people um, are a little bit angry with Jesus for that statement? I mean, really? She's so busy working on his behalf. I mean, can't he stand up for Martha just a little bit? So, you know, for such a long time, this story has been used to create this hierarchy between service and our tasks for God and the life of the mind. And one traditional story says that, you know, because Jesus really affirmed Mary, that means that we should be in an endless Bible study, I guess, and never feed anyone, that the mind and worship and devotion are the better part and service and hospitality are a lesser way to God. Now, I don't think this is what Jesus was saying. I mean, this is the, the, the Savior who came back and said to Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. He didn't say go study the Torah more. He said feed my sheep. Our service matters. I think what Jesus was really trying to say is that first and foremost, we have to be attentive. We have to be paying attention. Martha's distracted. She's distracted and worried. She's busy trying to impress her guest, but he's the host of all of life, and she's not really noticing him. Mary is sitting there, focused on the person in front of her, listening to what he has to say with complete attention. And I think Jesus is telling us that's the way to do what really matters. Now, because this is a story of two women, and there aren't too many of those 
in the Bible. I have to digress for just a moment and say how radical Jesus is really being here because this is one of those moments where I'm like, I love my Jesus. So the scripture says that Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. And we tend to think of that as kind of a general expression for she's learning, she's listening, she's paying attention. Maybe we've heard it translated as, right, she's devoted, she's worshiping. But it wasn't a general expression in the first century. It was a very specific expression used to describe the intimate relationship between a rabbi and a disciple. It's very specific. And in fact, no woman was allowed to do this. At that particular time in the first century, there was a debate going on about whether women could learn the Torah or not. And here's how it went. Some rabbis said girls, not women, could learn Torah in their own homes from their fathers only, nowhere else, only from their fathers in their own homes. And some said even that was an abomination because where should women be? in the kitchen doing what Martha was doing. And Jesus says, no, I affirm a different kind of life for every human being, and particularly for women. The life of the mind, the life of study, the life of knowledge is not forbidden. It's the most important thing to be able to claim God for yourself. So there's radical Jesus. I love him. And what it means for all of us, is that this this Jesus way to an abundant life is about being truly, fully present to God, wherever God is, whether it's in our Bible study or in our kitchen or in our act of service, in our daily lives, being fully, fully engaged in our bodies and in our lives. And from that place of attention, our correct action will follow. So are we paying attention or are we distracted and worried? I'm way more distracted and worried than I should be on a regular basis, just like Martha scurrying around, scurrying around, doing stuff, doing stuff, feeling useful, but not really slowing down and paying attention And often when we do stuff, are we really present and aware of why we're doing what we're doing? Or are we just fulfilling that checklist that we do every day, right? This is what I do. Jesus is inviting us into a life of awareness that God is in us, that God is in others. And from that attention, when we act, we we can say to ourselves, I am doing this to sustain the life of God in the world today, right? It gives purpose to our action. It's what God asks of us. Now, I know that in our world, many would say the only way that we can really gain that kind of awareness is to retreat from life, to focus for a moment on our thoughts and our souls, so that we can come back to the world with a different perspective. I don't think so. I think we can find this awareness in the midst of everyday life. I think that, yes, we can find God on a yoga retreat. We can find God in meditation. We can find God gardening in our backyard in the morning, sitting with our cup of coffee, with full gratitude and awareness for the earth that sustained the beans and the people that picked and roasted them. We can find God painting walls at Tri-Valley Haven, going on a service project. We can find God laughing at our own dinner table. It's all about our awareness and how we understand what we're doing. We don't have to always retreat from life. Sometimes we can just inhabit our lives more completely. 
That's the spirituality that I think God invites us to, to really pay attention, to honor our bodies, even when they're sick, even when they're failing, to honor other bodies, to honor other people, to live in a way that fully glorifies the God who is with us. So if we find ourselves like that pilgrim, maybe not with such a long beard, but faced with that choice between the meaning of life over here and cheese and crackers over here, it's a false division. It's just a false division. And Jesus would tell us, choose the cheese and crackers. Celebrate this God who is with us and honor God's presence every day. Amen. continue in a time of prayer, and I do have a few joys and concerns to share. Um, the first joy is that our SSP youth and leaders left for Oregon right on time at 6 a.m. this morning. Um, yes, they, they did. They were all, were all early, in fact. Um, and so we do pray for their safety and that they have a wonderful week of service in Chiloquin. Um, also, uh, Kareen and David lift up uh, prayers of gratitude first for um, Nate's family as they had a beautiful celebration of Kathy Failing's life that was um, last weekend, um, but also to hold in our prayers, um, Bill, is that Kathy's husband, Bill, who is now in the hospital as well. So prayers for the Failings. Um, and we continue to hold our world um, so much joy and so much conflict and chaos. Those that, uh, that come to the, the forefront of the media's attention and some that, that don't. Um, so we continue to pray for the people of Ukraine, and Sudan, 
people of Gaza and Israel. And I wanted to just lift up a prayer for the people of Haiti. They are special to me. Um, and a foreign police force has finally arrived to try to help manage some of the chaos and gang violence in Haiti. And I pray that that, um, that, that is effective and restores their order, um, their government. Um, let's just pause and in a time of silence, lift up before our God all the joys, all the blessings of our lives and those things with which we struggle. Loving creator God, we come to you with gratitude for this gift of life and its many blessings, for music that fills our ears and our souls, for love that carries us, for all the moments of health and joy that delight us. We give you thanks for all of these things. We lift up to you also the concerns of our lives and our world. We pray for those struggling through everyday life, struggling with relationships and work and daily challenges, those struggling with poverty, with illness, we pray, too, for our beleaguered earth. Give us the courage to change how we live in order to protect your creation. Help us, Lord, to humbly follow you, to offer compassion and grace each day, to keep learning and growing in the way of your love. It's in the spirit of your Son and the way that he taught us that we offer this prayer and we pray together the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I have just a few announcements of ways we can continue to grow in faith and build our community. Um, the first is a reminder about giving with generosity. Um, as always, our regular offerings support all the ministries of this church, yes, they keep the lights on, they keep us singing and celebrating and worshiping. We also have our special offering opportunity um, to support our Tri-Valley Haven backpack drive. Next Sunday is the last Sunday to bring in those supplies, and then I think it's the last week of July that we will be handing them out. So one more week to make those collections. Also next Sunday, we'll hear a little bit from our SSP youth about their experience, and then throughout the month of July, we'll hear from our Stephen ministers about their ministry and focus ourselves on the power of prayer. Also want you to just save the date. We will have some um, postcards for invitations uh, coming in just a few weeks. But on August 10th, Saturday, August 10th, we're going to throw our own Jesus party. And we want to invite the whole community to come. The band will be playing. We will have food trucks, carnival games, um, and lots of fun on Saturday night, August 10th. And we want you to invite your friends to come for um, a celebration. So postcards and invitations will be in just a couple of weeks. With that, I'd invite you to stand for our closing hymn. Oh. 
heart for God. Go to the world in peace. Go for the God. Go to the world in joy. To serve God's people every day and hour. And serving Christ our every gift and Rejoicing in the Holy Spirit's power, go forth for God, go to the world in joy. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit Find a welcome in your heart, a welcome at your table, and lead you in the banquet feast of life. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.